chapter three deals you know with some of the issues with selling on the web which of course since this is a class about e-commerce <laughs> that's a pretty important topic so let's go over some of the basics one of the real challenges with e-commerce is maintaining a personal relationship with our customers instead of just having this impersonal you know nameless electronic transaction so one of the ways that businesses have attempted to make things more personal is this concept of a personal shopper this is an algorithm that learns the particular preferences buying habits of a customer and then based on past browsing and purchases tries to be helpful and make some suggestions hey you might also be interested in this Amazon is a great example of that Amazon knows what you have purchased in the past and how often and so they will frequently make suggestions to you about other products or even they will analyze and say we notice that every three months you're ordering the same thing why don't we go ahead and set you up on a subscription service and we'll give you a discount if you sign up to get this item automatically sent to you every few months another way of trying to make the experience more personal is this idea of a virtual model and what's involved there is that you go to a location and you have your physical body measurements recorded into their system and then this can allow you to virtually try on clothes and see how they fit on your body or even to order clothes that are custom tailored exactly to your dimensions based on what's stored in the system and again this is trying to say how do we have a virtual dressing room where you know our customers can try on the clothing items and make sure they like the way it looks and the way it hangs on their particular body the driving force behind this besides um, being more personal is that there's a very high percentage of clothing ordered online that gets returned because it didn't fit quite right and so the use of virtual fitting rooms can reduce that now one of the real issues with this approach is that different computer monitors have different color capabilities and so you might look at something and say yeah that's exactly the color I want but when you get it you say it's not the same color as what it showed on my monitor well it could be that your monitor was the problem one of the ways to address that is to send a fabric swatch on request so that someone can see what does it really look like what does the fabric really feel like and then also the author says or you can offer generous return policies I would say regardless you should always offer generous return policies Costco is a great example of that no questions asked you want to return it done deal um, companies need to be you know more generous that way and yes some people will abuse it but it's far worth it to really be more customer focused in your returns policy so when it comes to advertising most newspapers or magazines also publish an online version of the print copy and the print content is getting less and less or if you're in the Portland area the newspaper the print version is delivered to the home only four days out of the week but there's an electronic version available seven days a week now certainly you can sell advertising to cover the costs of the electronic version of the website uh, the newspapers web presence you know it provides greater exposure to the advertising audience uh, but it does detract from the sale of the print revenue uh, 
print editions, you will find that they generally use a mixed revenue model. By that we mean some of the content is free, whereas if you want to delve deeper into some of the stories or additional information, you may have to have a paid version of access to the website. So maybe not everything is available. When you hear the term paywall, what that's referring to is if you have a you know newspaper that says, okay, this content is free, but this additional content you have to pay for, the paywall is that point where you start charging fees. You know, everything up until the paywall is free, after the paywall, there's some cost associated with it. You know, targeted advertising sites generally can charge more than general. Because if I know that, you know, 90% of the people that see my ad and that I'm paying for are potential customers. I'm willing to pay more money per ad than if I know this is a, a general site and so maybe only 5% of the people visiting that site are even the target market that I'm approaching. In that case, you know, which is called the shotgun approach, I don't want to pay as much because I know most of those people that see the ads, it's worthless. It's not going to, they're not going to become customers. The way to think of it is in the old days before electronic commerce, you would mail an advertising flyer to every household and business within a zip code. You know, knowing full well that for many of those deliveries, it, they were going straight into the trash. They were not, you know, of interest to the people involved. I would challenge the author on this statement that classified advertising like Craigslist has been very bad for newspapers. It's been the death of newspapers. The classified ads were the primary funding source for newspapers. Once Craigslist came along and that funding source dried up, many newspapers around the country were no longer solvent. We've seen a lot of newspapers go completely out of business and the ones that still remain in business, the newspaper now is maybe only 15 or 20 percent as big as it used to be because there's no revenue to support publishing what used to be published. Web employment sites, an interesting thing here, have been very successful in targeted classifying the classified advertising. And so sites like CareerBuilder and Monster.com they know a lot of information about the people on their sites, and so it's uh, it's one way that you can really tailor an ad to a specific type of individual. So you can have very targeted uh, advertising. There's a number of other sites, used vehicle sites like Autotrader.com. Uh, there's sites for used RVs. Uh, I think that one's called it may be RVTrader.com or uh, you know, and ones for motorcycles, specifically to boats, a lot of different uh, specific, you know, different than Craigslist that is general, but they're targeted to a specific, per, you know, type of vehicle, boat, whatever. So one way that's done on the web too is this mixed revenue model again where subscribers pay a fee and for that I will get access to the information with some advertising so it's not an ad free and some organizations have chosen to go that route as a way of keeping the cost to subscribe down because they've still got some revenue coming in from advertisers as opposed to, 
you know, if you're going to be completely ad free, then they have to charge you a little more. ESPN, you know, takes advantage, you know, of the cable industry, you know, uh, they're leveraging that. Consumer Reports is an example of a subscription site where you have to pay to get access to their reports, but there is no advertising whatsoever. In fact, that's a big part of Consumer Reports. They say they do not accept any advertising funds because they want to remain unbiased, unaffected by potential uh, companies that would advertise. They do uh, provide some free information really as a teaser to get people to say, hey, I should really subscribe to the, the whole thing. Uh, personally, I subscribe to Consumer Reports, even though in any given year, I may or may not access the information it's just kind of nice to know that i've got ready access to that if i need it this one uh is interesting as the author uses this as an example of disintermediation and again you remember that fancy term disintermediation just refers to the fact that as a manufacturer i have multiple ways of getting my product or service to the end consumer and if I lower the price or change the terms or the features in one channel, I can negatively, adversely affect the sales that I have going through another channel. And so we have to be aware of the different channels we have for getting our product or service to the user. So in the example here, Originally, full-line brokers charged a lot, but they would give free advice. So they might charge you $75 to execute a stock purchase or sale. But in the 70s, with deregulation, other things that happened, all of a sudden, we saw the appearance of discount brokers. E-Trade, Scott Trade, you know, a number of that came up and says, hey, we're not going to charge you $75. Uh, we'll charge you $20 a trade. Now, they t also said, but we're not going to give you any advice. You need to figure out yourself what is good stock, what is bad stock, but we'll execute the trade for you very quickly. Now, the prices have dropped all the way down to you know, $4.95 per trade and less in some cases. So they've gotten very um, efficient and inexpensive to do trades. Now then E-Trade kind of took the best of both worlds and they said, we'll offer you some advice, but we'll also give you the inexpensive you know, cost for executing the trade. And so kind of the best of both worlds. And really, when you look at the brokerage firms that are still in existence today that survived the uh, big you know, decline in the re recession of 2008, almost all of their business is done now online. Very little of it is done in person. And in fact, if you go to the you know, the stock exchange and look at how many traders are on the floor you know, negotiating those trades, it is a fraction of what it used to be because everything now is being done online, electronically. One of the things that allowed that to happen is that with the banking and financial industries, we didn't have a physical product. It was a transaction, a financial transaction, which is very easy to do electronically. Now, there were some hesitations initially because concerns about security. But as the author points out now, people have become you know, comfortable with and confident with that to, to the point of estimated at least 84% of U.S. households use online banking services. And I'd suggest it might even be higher than that. 
the interesting thing that that allowed to have happen is that not only did you have the existing brick and mortar banks offering online services, but also online banks started up that had no physical presence. You know, you can search online, you can find online banking companies that are completely online. And of course, one of the reasons for doing that is it's less expensive to set up a completely online function. Consequently, they can charge lower free, lower fees, uh, provide better interest rates on their products, and you know can be a benefit to the consumer. So we are seeing more and more fee-based websites. You know, a lot in the games area, entertainment, but even in financial advice services where you pay a monthly fee to access their web-based services. I use a, uh, an organization to make recommendations to me every day on particular investments. And I go to their website, I have to log in, it co you know, I pay a monthly fee for access to that website and to their information. And so as, as author points out here, a lot of the online game sites have <clears throat> premium games now and then the, the free games, so to speak, using that hook and pay strategy where you get someone trying it out and say, hey, this is pretty cool and, you know, but only let you get to level two, let's say, and to continue playing and go on to level three to 20, well, we just need this $1.50 a month fee. You know, a lot of times they're pretty reasonable, uh, low cost monthly fee. Luxury goods. This was one that, that when I started uh, teaching e-commerce, I found interesting. You would think that a luxury good item, let's say a Fabergé egg, that you wouldn't really sell that online because when you are paying tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars for an item, I would think you would want to actually see the item in person before shelling out that kind of money. But interestingly enough, high-end goods like that, there are websites that sell them and some people are willing to buy and to spend that kind of money without actually having physically seen them. Um, you know, I was surprised, but that's the way it's turning out. One of the things you'll notice on those higher end goods, though, some of them don't offer all their items online. Like the example there, Calvin Klein. They're selling their ready to wear on the website, but not some of their other clothing lines. As I mentioned, the jewelry sales have have really taken off. And I think, you know, one of the reasons, as is pointed out here, you know, like with Costco, they're providing independent appraisal certificates along with the item. So you're saying, okay, how do I know that this really is a you know, one and a half carat diamond. Well, they're providing the certificates along with it. And as mentioned early, Costco has a great return policy. So you spend all the, you know, you spend three, four thousand dollars for some jewelry, you get it and you go, you know, it just doesn't look as good as I thought it would. And Costco's no problem. They'll take it back, return, you know. And so I think that's one of the, that easy to return has helped the luxury goods. So you know that I really am not risking a lot of money because if I don't like it, I can always take it back. <clears throat> so then the author talks about how do we create an effective business presence online? You know, what, what about this public image that we convey to our stakeholders? Remember our stakeholders, include customers, 
but they also include our suppliers, employees, stockholders, you know, the general public. The mistake that some companies make is that they don't worry about image until they grow to be a significant size. And I would kind of flip that around and say, if you want to grow to be a large size company, you need to be concerned about your image from day one and be thinking about that and how you position yourself. So an effective web presence is really critical for the smallest and newest firms. I think this is something the web presence really says a lot about your company and from day one you need to pay attention to it. Oftentimes with startup companies you're so focused about growing sales and other things you're not paying attention to some of the details like this of the public image, what's being said about you on social media, how easy is your website to use, all those things very important from day one. The author gives a good chart here of what the objectives and strategies are. You can read through it. It's a reference. What I will point out, a couple of the items there, making the site interesting. You want someone that lands on your site to stay. You want them to spend time on your site. That's only going to happen if you make your site engaging and you have content that is of value and interest to the people coming to the site. So you really have to think about what you're trying to accomplish with your website. It is not just to make sales. And along with that is the idea of uh, you want visitors to come back. Why would someone come back to your site? Well, the only reason to come back is if you're providing new and uh, constantly changing information. So I say, you know, it's been a couple, three days since I've checked to see what this um, analyst is saying about the outlook of the stock market. So I want to go back and see, well, what are they saying now? If I go there and I see, gee, the most recent information is three weeks old, I'm not going to go back to that website in the future because I'm going to say, oh, they never have up-to-date information. So encouraging visitors to return, you need to have up-to-date, constantly updated content, or you may want to do things like having a daily raffle. You know, a daily, you know, take this survey each day and get entered in to win a gift card. Some reason to encourage people to come back. And it's interesting now, we've been talking about profit companies. Nonprofits have a lot of the same issues, but there are some differences. For most nonprofits, the primary goal of the website is to disseminate information about the organization. Of course, with the idea that what you want to do is encourage people who are going to donate and support you financially. So to be successful with a nonprofit, really this the second item I think is important. You want this two-way interaction. You want potential donors to feel that they're connected with your organization, that they can ask a question and you'll reply and you'll engage in a dialogue with them. So one example is like the ALCU. They serve many different constituencies and they find a way to communicate and to engage in their audience, with their audience. So use the website to do that, to stay in touch with existing stakeholders, people that have a relationship with you. And you're also wanting to stay in touch so that you can identify new opportunities in how you can serve them, either with products or services what's important to them now at this point we're going to pause and this is the password for the chapter 3 quiz so write it down usability remember again it's case sensitive <laughs> excuse me and if necessary 
you should pause this video so you can get a paper and pen and write it down. Okay, on to the next part. Website usability. Gee, I wonder where I got the password from. Most businesses make the mistake of pushing too much information to the visitors and don't offer adequate opportunities for the, the visitor to interact with the, the website. It's too much one way. People really want to have a two way interaction. And there's a lot of tools that are out there that you can use for analysis of your website to see how usable is it, where are the issues. One of the things that you can do to help you identify that if you have Google Analytics installed on your website, you can see what pages are people going to, how often are they staying there, and that can point to help you to find out if there's a page that um, people spend a lot of time on. It may mean that they're really interested in that topic, or it could be that it's so confusing it takes people a long time to figure out where to go to next. Likewise, if you see someone that the average time they spend on the page is three seconds, uh, there must be something misleading. They end up going to that page and they're saying, that's not what I wanted. Or else, it's very easy. They immediately see what they need to do and they're on to the next one. So use of Google Analytics can point you to some parts of your website that you should take a look at to see uh, if there's room for improvement. One of the issues with usability is accessibility. We have to remember there are people that have visual challenges, people that are colorblind. If you have someone who is colorblind and the most common form of colorblind is they can't differentiate between red and green. So if you've put a lot of your information on your website in red and green and they're looking at it and seeing it's the same and they're going, I don't know what I'm supposed to do because everything looks the same color to me. And there are certainly issues with people that have vision capabilities. And so how easy is your site for someone that is visually impaired? And what could you do to make it easier to use? Some people, due to motor skills, may have troubles clicking on a tiny box. Do you make the action buttons nice and large so that it's easy for someone to click on it? Again, there are tools there that are available that you can use to analyze your website for accessibility issues. One thing that's important as we're in this whole topic of usability is that you want to build trust with your visitors. Trust that you're going to protect their personal information. Trust that you are a reputable company so that you can start building feelings of loyalty towards the organization that this is a good company. Things like, what does your company do to better the community where your headquarters are? You know, what nonprofit does your company support? That really helps people understand the nature of your company. Are they going to trust you? And do they feel like this is a company I want to continue supporting by buying their products and services because I believe in what they stand for. <clears throat> when you're, we're talking about websites, another thing that you have to think about and be aware of is asking yourself, why did someone come to visit my website in the first place? People have different reasons for being on your website. Some of them include yeah, I've heard about this company and I'm interested, want to know about their products and services. I'm just looking for information. Or it may be, I'm shopping. I need some products. Or it could be, 
I want warranty repair work, or I need to know what's the warranty and you know service policies. You know, how can I get that? Or it could be just general information about the company. And that kind of leads to the next one. Or I'm wanting financial information because I'm considering investing in this company. If I'm going to buy a company's stock, I want to know something about the company. The general you know, company, when was it founded? Where are their headquarters? What countries are they in? And you know, what are their financials look like? Or I might be coming because I'm looking for some contact information. You know, maybe I'm doing research for a paper or I'm looking for a job or some other thing that, and so I need to know how to contact. Sometimes it's because there was a link on another site and I clicked on that link because I'm thinking, okay, they will give me additional information. Why it's important to think about these is that as you address the needs of those different customers, they're, they're, can, your visitors are coming for different reasons, making sure that you have an easy way to address those specific needs, even if they were not looking to buy a product or service today, it will help convert those visitors into future customers. So make sure you have thought about why does someone end up on my website and do I have an easy way to address all those different needs that they might have. So again, uh, mentioned a, a little earlier about accessibility. There are a number of websites that contain information about what you need to do to make your site more accessible to people with disabilities, whether it's visual, or it could be hearing impaired too. Uh, if you start off your website with a video that is, you know, got sound associated with it, do you have closed captioning available so that hearing impaired people can also uh, participate in that? One thing I would point out is that a really good website allows visitors to choose attributes on your website. For example, auto loading the videos. You know, I generally want the ability to turn that off and say, do not auto start a video when I come to your homepage. If I want to watch the video, I will click on it. Some of the things that we could say, you know, is a poor website design is Adobe Flash. Adobe Flash is really fallen out of favor because of security issues to the point also Flash is no longer available on any Apple product. So if you design your website around Flash, you have to know that it's not going to work on an Apple device. Another mistake that people make is high-res graphics that are way too um, high in their bits of resolution. It slows down how fast a page can load and we have to remember not everybody, not all of your customers live in areas that they have access to high speed, high bandwidth internet. My friend who lives in a suburb of Portland, I mean he's only, you know, 15 miles, 20 minutes from downtown Portland. The particular area is in he has no access to broadband. The best that he can get for internet uh, service is satellite, which is inherently not that fast. So don't just take a picture with a high resolution camera and upload the image. If you scale down the resolution of the image, you can drastically reduce the size of the image down to 20% or less of what the original image was. <clears throat> and it won't look any different on the monitor because the monitors are limited. The graphic display that we use to display that image 
have limited. So when you include more information than a typical monitor can display, all you're doing is slowing down how fast that page can load. Another thing to be careful of is hard to read color palettes. Some of the websites you look at uh, there, you know, the ones that you looked at for, you know, worst websites have just these color palettes that really hurt your eyes. They make it so hard to find the information. So really think about the color palettes. There's bunches of articles out there as to what are pleasant, soothing, appealing color palettes. One mistake that some people make is to go with a dark background. There have been lots of studies out there that white characters on a dark background are much harder to read than black characters on a white background. That's why you'll notice all the slides that I use in my presentations have a light background with dark characters. That's the easiest to read. We'd mentioned earlier that uh, about building trust with the customer and the reason that this is so important is that there's some, been some suggested studies that just a 5% increase in customer loyalty can yield an increase of your profit of 25 to 80%. You know, there's huge gains to be made by just small incremental improvements in customer loyalty, repeat customers. Service can be a very powerful differentiating factor that will help with that loyalty and repeat customer and will also help in initially getting customers. And in general, people will pay extra for better delivery, order handling, after sales support. And that's what leads to customer loyalty in the long run. Um, we've already talked about the usability of the website and again this slide is just to remind you that the purpose of testing and evaluation is that you want to have your customers enjoy the time on your website. One of the things you want to avoid is the situation where customers came to your website, they spent some time, and they left, and they didn't buy anything. And of course, the worst case is where they put actually put something in their shopping cart and failed to check out. You want to monitor that, and if that is happening, it tells you there's something wrong with your website. There's some reason why people are giving up and not completing the transaction. One of the ways that you can really improve customer satisfaction is making contact information very easy to find and making sure that your call center is staffed appropriately. We live in a global economy, so if you staff your call center from 8 to 5 Eastern Standard Time, but you sell products all around the world, that's not serving your customer base. You have to figure out how am I going to staff this and support people that call in different time zones. Certainly you have to think about the Pacific coast of this country, but you also have to think about Europe and Asia and other places that your products might be sold. One great way to get some feedback on usability is to create a focus group. People like to talk about what's important to them just give them the opportunity. And when you do all this t usability testing, yes, it does cost money, but it is very low when you compare it to having to completely redesign your website. Do the usability testing, the customer focus groups, all of those, use that to drive you, you know, to help you make smart decisions. Being customer centric in your website design, it's, I would say, not just an important part of successful e commerce. It is the foundation and it is essential. If you're going to be successful, 
everything about your website design has to be focused on the customer. It should not be focused on you and how best you can display your products, but it should be focused on how do your customers want your products displayed to make it as easy as possible for them to choose. So focus that you're really trying to meet all the different types of people that come to your website. How do you meet all of their needs? And that will really, you know, some keys to the, the design. Again, uh, this is kind of a summary of what I've talked about so far. You want to make their experiences efficient. You know, people really appreciate when they can find information quickly. They don't want to spend a half an hour on your website trying to find where in the heck you hid the customer contact information. <clears throat> and making it memorable, enjoyable. Maybe you have a trivia quiz on your website, you know, and everybody that participates in the trivia quiz each day, all the successful answers, the correct answers are entered into a drawing for a gift card or something. So you, you make it kind of fun. Lastly, one thing that or haven't mentioned up to this point is have to remember that more and more people are using their mobile device as their primary method of e-commerce. The key there is it's a little tiny screen. You have to think about how does your website look on a little tiny screen. And in fact, I would say you have to have two versions of your website. One that's designed for this nice big monitor on your desktop, your laptop, or your tablet. And a different one that's been optimized for the small screen of a mobile device. The good news for small startup companies, you're saying, oh great, now I gotta do two websites. A lot of the hosting services you know, depending on where you choose to host your website, offer you a feature where they will automatically create the mobile-friendly version for you. My website portfolio is hosted by GoDaddy. I created the desktop large screen version and they automatically created a mobile-friendly version for me that is pretty good. It's not bad at all. And again, the last thing I'll leave you on this chapter is that when you're designing that website, you really want a site that is focused on the customer and the process they go through to purchase items, not from the company's perspective. It doesn't matter if the website is great for me and my company, it needs to be it's great for the customer. Success is in the eyes of the customer, not in the eyes of the company. And that's it for chapter three.